Well, good morning. Good to be with you. Um, I am the new association mission strategist for the Stanley Montgomery Baptist Association. I've had the blessing to get to know your pastor and his wife a little bit. Love them. You are truly blessed to have Pastor Danny. And i um, uh, been blessed. To, I think it was in March when I came, and I think y'all had the, the po Man's, uh uh, dinner and man that was good so I know that y'all are truly Baptist because y'all cook well so um, but it is a blessing to be with you uh, today this morning and this evening um, we're going to be looking at the church and uh, so if you have your Bible I'd like for you to turn to the book of Acts today we're going to look at the church God's way and we're going to focus on who the church should be and then tonight when we come back, we're going to look at, I think, what's the most important thing the church should be doing, and um, that most churches aren't. And so we'll be looking at that this evening. But if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 40 through 47 this morning, and I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open as, as we work through the passage this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, we just invite your spirit to come, and Lord, I pray that today would be an encouragement to South Albemarle, I thank you for this fellowship and the believers here. Lord, we pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, that today they will make you, Lord, their personal Savior and Lord. And I pray that you will use this message to encourage and strengthen this fellowship for your work and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, many Christmas Eve's I've spent late at night when my kids were younger putting together presents. And I would get the present, open up the box real quick to try to put the thing together and look at the box and see what it was supposed to look like and get to work on it. And about 30 minutes into it, realized it looked nothing like it. And so I would have to then dig through all the stuff and finally find the directions and read what I was supposed to do. And then... As I read the instructions and worked step by step, finally, it looked like what the inventor had chosen it to look like. And you know, I think in America today, part of the problem with the church is that we are not doing things as the creator of the church has directed us, Jesus. We do things our ways. We try to do it the quick way. We try to do it the easy way. We sometimes think we know better than the inventor. But the truth is, is God has a way for his church to work. And as we look at 2024, let's make a commitment to make South Albemarle a church the way God wants it to be. And I believe it begins by looking at who is supposed to make up the church. And I want you to see in the beginning here is that the church is supposed to be a saved church. Notice in verse 40, he says, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, these people 
who made up the church, the early church, were saved. Now, they weren't good people. They weren't perfect people. They were actually wicked people. They were a part of the perverse generation. We see earlier in verse 36 of chapter 2, he says, listen, you are responsible for the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty wicked, folks. And that's what he says about these people. These people were just like you and me. If, if you struggle with sin, well, you're in good company because that's what made up the early church. But you know what? They were saved. And that's what our church needs to be made of. Notice in verse 37, you see that when they heard the gospel message, they were cut to the heart. They were willing to confess their sin. They were willing to say, you know what? I admit what I have done is wrong. And I realize that there's a just punishment that I should receive for it, and I can't pay that myself. So I understand that there is one who paid it for me. I am in need of grace. Secondly, notice that then they ask, well, what shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter said, you need to first of all repent. You see, we don't really understand what I think repentance means. Repentance does not mean that you fix yourself. Because none of us can. If we could fix ourselves, folks, we wouldn't need to be saved. So repentance is not saying, I fixed myself. Anybody ever go fishing out here? When you go fishing, do you ever catch clean fish? No, nope. you catch dirty fish, and then you have to what? Clean them. Well, the same thing happens to us. Jesus has to catch us first, and then he cleans us. But see, repentance is saying, listen, I realize I'm doing wrong, and no longer do I choose to follow my way. Now I am going to turn, and I seek through the power of God to be able to do things God's way. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not something we do one time in our life. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's saying, no longer do I go this way. I am choosing to follow God and to go this way. And then, not only are we called to repentance, but we see that he also says that we need to be baptized. You see, when we have true repentance, repentance says that I'm not just sorry for my sin and the consequences that I'm suffering through it, but I'm sorry to where I'm willing to change. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says this, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss for us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, for the sorrow of the world produces death. You see, there's a lot of people who are sorry because their sin is causing a lot of hardship in their life. And so they go, man, I hate that my sin is causing me to be miserable. But then they continue to live in it. Folks, that's not repentance. Repentance is when you get to the place where you say, I'm sorry that I sinned against a holy God and I want to live a different way. And so then what we have to do is we have to be baptized. Now, notice that baptism here is not talking about water baptism. Water baptism is only symbolic of what happens when we truly get baptized by Jesus. In order to be saved, we do have to be baptized, not by water, but we have to be baptized by Jesus in the Holy Spirit. It's when we're baptized by Christ that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit that all of our sins are washed away and the Holy Spirit now comes and lives inside of us and gives us a new power to be able to live the Christian life. God's not asking you to live righteously. You can't. What he's asking you to do is admit that you need his grace and he will supply everything you need through his Holy Spirit living in you. And you see, when you get baptized, not only do you individually get washed away of your sins, but you get added to the family 
of God. You are placed into the church. And when you are baptized, the Spirit of God washes away your sin. There's no condemnation. You know you're going to heaven. You have a new power to walk in righteousness. And you are connected to the church. And because of that, you are giving a spiritual gift. And those gifts you are called to use in the church. Some of you might be a finger. How wonderful would it be if your finger was cut off from your hand and it just laid up here? What could your finger do? Nothing. What if you were an eye and your eye was separated from your body? How helpful is that to you? Not much. You see, if you're a part of the body, you need to be what? You need to be connected. You need to be connected in order to function, but also do you realize that the body of Christ needs you and what you offer? And as a Christian, God has saved you to be able to use your spiritual gifts for the body. People who are called out of this perverse generation, and we live in a perverse generation too, amen? But you know, people can still be saved. They can be called out of it. This is who makes up the church. People who were called out, who were fallen sinful people, but they were convicted over their sin, and they were willing to say, I'm willing to repent. I'm willing to walk in a new way. I believe that Jesus Christ died for the penalty of my sin, and he rose again to give me life. And now he has brought me into fellowship with his spirit and with the people of God. And today, though, I think many of our churches are filled with people who live like the world. You don't see any difference from the people inside the church and the people who live outside the church. You have no commitment to following the ways of Jesus. They're not using their talents or their treasure or their time to serve the kingdom of God. Could it be that the problem is is that many who make up the membership of the church aren't truly saved. You see, when you receive people for membership at South Albemarle, they need to be saved people. You know, when Jesus was presenting the gospel, did you know Jesus always presented the truth on the front end? Remember when the young rich ruler came to him and he was just honest with him and he said, listen, if you want to follow me, you've got to give up everything and then you can follow me. He said, listen, the least of my disciples, the least has to take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, Jesus was always up front on the front end. But in the church of America, we we tend to try to get like some bait and switch gimmick And we try to get people to say a prayer and think they're saved. And then we try to get them to live the way they're supposed to live. That's how Jesus did it, folks. Jesus was just always up front on the front end. Listen, it is going to cost you everything. And if you're willing, you can come. Remember when he was talking to the people who got the 5,000 that he fed, the 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 free fish and the the free loaves of bread they were all in for that free food let's go we'll follow you and then he says hey wait 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 you've got to follow me because i am the bread of life and you've got to partake of me for spiritual nourishment and then it says in john that they turned away never to follow him again did you know that jesus wasn't interested in getting the largest crowd what he was interested in was having a church of people who were truly committed to following him. Because if he had that, that's what can change the world. And that's what we need in America today, is a church of people who are saved. Too many are trying to get people who are supposedly saved to commit, and what we need to realize is that what we need is people who are saved, who have already received the grace of God and are truly committed. So today I ask you the question, are you saved? Not not, have you said a prayer one time in your life 
Not did you raise your hand in a service. Not did you walk down an aisle. Not have you been dunked in water. Have you come to the place where you have truly been convicted of your sin, sorrowful for your sin, repented of your sin, and trusted Christ to save you and allow his grace to transform you? This is what we need today is the church to be made up of saved people. But we also see three attributes of these saved people in this passage. And I want you to look at these attributes today and understand this is not what the early church did. This is who the early church was. And I want you to look at your life today and say, is this who I am? Is this who South Albemarle is? And the first thing we see about this church in verse 42 is that they loved God. Notice in verse 42 it says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice it says they continue steadfastly. That word means they were devoted, they were faithful. Who was the early church devoted to? Who did the early church worship? They worshiped God. Why? Because they loved him. And because they loved God, it says here they wanted to come and and, and they wanted to hear the apostles' doctrine. Does anybody know what that means? They were in the word of God. They prayed. It it, it says they fellowship. It says they, they broke bread together. Why did they do these things? They they, they came and they studied the Word of God not to do a religious activity. They they came because they were in a relationship. They were grateful that God had forgiven their sin and they wanted to hear from God. So they came so that they could study the Scriptures so that they could grow closer to God. They prayed not because they were trying to do a religious activity. They were coming because they loved God and they wanted to be able to hear from Him and they wanted to express their gratitude gratitude they wanted to seek his will they they fellowshiped because they desired because the holy spirit of god was living in them they broke bread which not only showed that they connected together in having a meal but they were taking communion they were willing to worship the greatest commandment that jesus gave was this love the lord your god with what all your heart soul mind strength If you love God, you'll desire to be in his word and pray and worship because it's who you are. And the truth is, many in the church today don't do these things. And I think the reason is, is they don't truly love God above everything else. Again, Jesus was honest on the front end, wasn't he? He said, listen, if you're going to love me, you've got to love me greater than your father, your mother, your spouse, your children. You've got to love me above everything else. You see, this is the American gospel. And this is why I think there's a lot of people who are lost. Because we come to people and say, listen, We want you to add Jesus to your life. And there's a lot of people who have made that commitment and said, you know what, I'll add Jesus to my life. But folks, that is not the gospel that is in Scripture. The gospel in Scripture is that I will make Jesus my life. I give up everything else to follow him. When we look at the church of Ephesus in the Bible, on the outside it looked great. You know they had the apostle Paul come by and teach at that church. They had Timothy. They had John the apostle come and teach at that church. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus looks inside and sees the heart of the church. And how many of you know that Jesus can look past the show and he gets to the true matter? And how many of you know he does that in our life and he's doing this in our church? And in the the outside, it looked really good. The church of Ephesus did. He says, listen, 
Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have what? You left your first love. And he says, listen, because you left your first love, he says, I'm going to put out your candlestick. He says, I'm going to remove you. Did, you. did you get that? Jesus said, listen, there were other churches that were doing a lot of messed up things. He didn't threaten to do that to those churches. What he says is, I don't want to have a church that doesn't love me first and foremost. If that's the type of church that's out there, I don't want that church to be in existence anymore. I'm going to blow your candlestick out. But notice Jesus says, if you've lost your first love, this is what you can do to regain it. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Can some of us be honest today and say, I've got to be honest, Pastor. There's other things that I love more than God. He's not my first and highest love. And today, you know what? I I just need to take some time and remember. I need to remember what it was like when I first met him and remember what it was like to be lost in sin and to experience his forgiveness. I need to remember how faithful he has been to me and how good and how many blessings are just in my life because he has been a good God. I need to remember his love for me. And then I need to repent. You see, again, these people were saved. To repent is not just a one-time thing. It's a, it's a lifetime decision. It's, and it's to say, listen, there's things I've been filling my life with. And, 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 and I need to take those things, even though they may some be good. They're not what is best. I am going to turn from that my way. And I am going to turn to Christ. And then I'm going to redo the first work. Some of you remember what it was like when you first started dating your honey. You remember what you used to do? Stay up late, write love letters, go buy little gifts. Then you get married and you stop doing those things. Why? You want to get that spark back in your love life? Start doing those things again. You want to get your relationship back right with Jesus? Start doing the things you first did when you met him. When you first got saved, boy, you just wanted to be at church. You just wanted to read your Bible. You just wanted to spend time in prayer. You wanted to find ways to get involved in ministry. Why did you do that? Not because somebody was forcing you to. It's because you had been changed. And you wanted to do it because you were in love with Jesus. And you see, the early church was in love. And that's why they were doing these things. Folks, we need to fall deeply back in love with Jesus. Now notice, Jesus didn't say, wait until the feeling comes. And folks, that's where I think a lot of churches are. They're like, well, man, if if, if somehow we can just wait and somehow revival will come, it'll come. No, he didn't say, wait until the feeling comes. He said, get up and start doing the first works. Just go and do them. And you know what? If you will do the right thing, guess what will eventually come? The feeling that you want. Will you be obedient today to fall back in love and make Jesus the priority? Notice not only did they love God, but notice they also loved one another. Notice in verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone who had need. They loved one another. Isn't that what God said the two, or Jesus said the two greatest commandments were? First, to what? Love God, and then love your neighbor. And it's interesting that that here we see that, that discipleship is taking God's word and primarily applying it to the relationships we have in life. What does God ask us to do in Scripture usually? To be kind, to forgive, 
to provide, to serve, to be patient, to love. Well, how do we do that? I have to do that primarily in relationships with other people. Well, folks, it has to begin with the family that I live with, but then it has to transfer first and foremost to my church family. And we can't just say that we love people. We have to show it. Jesus said this in Romans 5, 8, or Paul did, God demonstrates his own toward love in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. How do you know that Jesus loves you? I'll tell you, you go look at Calvary. He died for you. Yeah, I, I like you guys a lot. But you know what? There's not one of you here that I would be willing to let my kids die for you. But you know, God has sent his son because he loved you so much to pay the penalty for your sin. You don't ever have to look and go, how do I know God loves me? He showed you how much he loved you. That's why... In 1 John, we see that, that we are called to not only love God, but if we truly love God, then we will what? Love one another. And how did they do that? Notice it says, verse 44, Now all who believed were together. They had unity. They, they shared all the things in common. They sold their possessions. They took care of each other. They were a family. Folks, that's what the church is supposed to be. It is supposed to be a family. You know what most of the churches in America are? A bunch of strangers that get together and worship individually. Let me tell you, it's going to take this to be the church that God wants you to be. You're going to have to invest time to build relationships with each other. But that's what the early church was that's what the early church did there's no way that you can love somebody unless you spend time with them and so to be a part of the church is to say the people in this room you're my brother and my sister we're family we're gonna go through life together you can count on me i've got your back you've got my back because we're sold out to the cause we love god and we love one another Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the sum, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Notice he says, listen, you need to stir something up in your church. Most people who stir stuff up in church are not stirring up good stuff. And if you're one of those people, stop it. This is what you're supposed to be stirring up, love and good works. And he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. And even the more, as you see what? The day approaching. Folks, the day is getting closer. And so we don't need to be doing what a lot of churches are doing, meeting less. We, we need to be getting together even what? More. Most recent church certificates after COVID show that the average church attendance in America for the average person who comes to church is 1.5 times a month. 18 times a year. And that's just to go to a service. And folks, can I tell you, if all you do is just go to a service, you're not going to church? Because to be a part of the church is to be a part of the body. You've got to be connected to the people. So you've got to be connected in some type of small group. Isn't that what it says that they did here in verse 46? So continuing daily in one accord, they met in the temple and in the breaking of bread from house to house. And how often did they do this? Daily. Now, if the early church was meeting daily... And the author of Hebrews says we need to be even meeting what? More. That doesn't mean that we have to meet here at this building. 
But we need to have some type of connection with people in our church on a daily basis. Calling them, saying a prayer, getting together for a study. Let me tell you, I'm excited. I saw on Tuesday night, see, y'all are going to be doing Experiencing God. Can I tell you, that, 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 that study right there will change your life. I've done a lot of studies in my life. I can tell you, besides the Bible, that, that book right there has been one of the greatest studies. If you've not done that, some of you, I, mean, I can't do that. It'll take an hour and a half out of my life. Folks, you've made Jesus Christ the highest priority in your life. You can give up that TV show. It's okay. Put God first. If we are Christians, we'll connect to the family, we'll use the gifts, we'll love one another with our time and our talent and our treasure. We'll make church a priority. And finally, we see that they not only love God, they loved each other, but notice they love the loss. Verse 47, it says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. As the association mission strategist, I get to go and visit a lot of our churches in Stanley Montgomery. And can I tell you, there's many of them who are on their way out and they're dying. You know why most churches die? Because most of them have stopped doing outreach. I heard something interesting recently. It said that in, you go to churches in Africa and Asia right now, you'll see something interesting, that when you go to a church, they have more in attendance than they do members in the church. And you know that's how it used to be in America? And that's how a normal church should be. Think about it. If, if you had 100 members, how many should be in the worship service? Probably like 120. Because those members should be doing what? Reaching out and inviting people. But most of our churches in America, we got more members that don't show up than we actually got members that do show up. Why? I don't know. Could it be that they truly aren't really members of the body? The talk, church talks a lot about what it should do. But folks, we don't need any more meetings and talk about what we should be doing. We just need to start doing what we should be doing. And some of you need to be able to take the lead in that. Some of you, don't, don't try to get everybody because you're not going to get everybody, but there are enough here. There are some who are being stirred right now and say, oh, I'll go out with you and we'll go find something to do in the community and talk to people about Jesus and serve people in our community and talk to people about Jesus and love on people. And you know what? As you go out and you talk to other people about the love you have for God and they see the love you have for one another, they're going to be people who will become new believers who will be added to this body. Jesus said this, By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. In 1 John 3, he said, My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. When we read about this in Acts, do you realize that this culture hated Christianity? These people had just murdered Jesus. They persecuted the church. And yet in that environment, the church grew wildly. Folks, we can't make up the excuse that we live in a fallen, messed up world. We do. We live in a perverse generation. We do. But let me tell you, the gospel is greater. The love of God is greater. And what we need is a church to save people who are radically sold out and love God and love one another. And they have a love for lost people. Jesus said this, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. How do you know if you're following Jesus? You can look and see, am I bringing other people with me? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? 
You see, if I'm following Jesus, then this is what he's going to do in my life. I'm not talking about adding activity to your life. Listen to me. I'm not saying just go and read the Bible more and pray more and and do more. What I'm saying is fall in love with God. Fall in love with one another. Have a heart to love the lost people, and you will just see those things beginning to take place in your life out of the love that you have for the person. Isn't that how it works in our marriage? Your wife nags you, go take out the trash, go do this, go do that. You're resentful. But you just think about how much you love your wife and you don't mind going and taking out the trash. You just do it instantaneously. Why? Because you know it's a blessing to her. It's, It's the motivation. We need to fall back in love with God. And if we do, then it will transfer to where we will love one another and that we will have a love for lost people. And you know what the great thing about the book of Acts indicates? In in Acts 8, 4, it says this, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And we know that was not talking about the apostles, because then they were still in Jerusalem. It was just the average layperson going out and sharing how Jesus had changed their life. And that's what caused the multiplication of the church. Can you imagine with me today what it would be like if a church full of saved members who love God, love one another, and love the lost began to just demonstrate that love by studying God's word together and praying, not just coming to the worship service, but coming to Bible study, not not just coming on a Sunday morning, but finding ways to go out into the community and use their gifts and, and, and then get to the place where, out of that love, other people were touched. Last night, I watched a football game. Some of you might have watched it also. My beloved Miami Dolphins lost to the Kansas City Chiefs. But you know what amazed me about that game? Is that it was played in minus 7 degrees. And the wind chill was 27 degrees below zero. But if you look in the stands, there were tens of thousands of people that were there. There were some of the fans of the men that were there, and they weren't even wearing a coat or a shirt. They were just out there. Why? They are idiots. But they were devoted. That's what they worshiped. Thanksgiving comes. Friday morning, there's people who get up and some of them have camped out for two or three days in front of Best Buy. Some of them are just getting up early. They, they, they will be there. Why? Because that's what they're devoted to. That is what they worship. What are you devoted to and what do you worship? If you're a Christian, you made the decision to say the thing that I worship, the thing I'm devoted to is Jesus Christ. And because he saved me, I understand that he placed me in the church. And so I love God and I love his church. And it begins to be the priority of who I am. It's not what I do, but it's who I am. As a Christian, I'm a guy who loves God with all my heart, mind, and soul. I love one another. And I love the lost. And my biggest fear is that in America, there's many who have heard a gospel that has said, please, 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 will you add Jesus to your life? Can I tell you that is not the gospel? Jesus didn't say that. Jesus was honest. Jesus said, listen, I'm not asking you to add me to your life. If you want me, I am worth everything. Give it all up and make me Lord. And if you do, what I do is I will wash you clean and forgive you of all your sins. 
and assure you that you will be with me forever and I will place you into a group of people known as the church and you will be with them and they will be people who love God just like you do and together you'll change the world. That's what our churches need to be. Will you make the commitment that that's who you will be at South Albemarle? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We see what you desire in the church, and we know that, Lord, it's so often to stray away from that. And God, I just pray today, if there's anyone here who has received a false gospel, where they've just added you to their life, but they never made you their life, and they realize today that they are ready to truly be saved, to be able to say, God, I can't earn my salvation. It's a free gift. But God, I understand that I've got to repent. I've got to be willing to turn from my way and, and face you. And, and God, I ask right now that you would forgive me of my sin. And I'm ready to receive you into my life and follow you. And be added to not only your corporate body forever in heaven, but to be added to this church, to be able to serve and use my gifts and talents to further your kingdom. And Father, I pray for those here today, Lord, as they examine their life at the beginning of this year, they would look and say, God, I have to be honest. You're not the greatest love of my life. I can look at the way I spend my time. I can look at the way I spend my resources. I can see how I'm using the talents and the gifts that you have given, and I can see that there's other things I'm more passionate about. There's other things I'm sacrificing for. And God, that's got to change. And today I'm just coming. And God, I just want to recommit myself at the altar today to say, God, you're going to be the greatest love. I'm going to fall in love with you. I'm going to love the people in this church. And I'm going to love the lost. Lord, we give you this time and ask you to do a work for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.